All in for this evening. The Rachel Maddow Show starts right now. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Chris. Thank you. you and thanks to you at home for joining us this hour. The conservative media and the conservative movement in this country have a single and undisputed home on the Internet. There's one low tech, mostly black and white website, which is basically the homepage online for the whole American right wing. And it has been the same website. It has been the same place for more than a decade now. And yeah, there have been others that have tried to topple it, but nobody's been able to. I mean, no offense to our friends uh, at the Fox News channel, but the Fox News website is terrible. Uh, even the new Fox News website is terrible. Uh, and when they got a new, new Fox News website recently, that too uh, was terrible. Nobody really uses the Fox News website as their homepage unless they're paid to do so because they work at the Fox News channel. Other well-funded entrepreneurial efforts have been made on the right to try to take over that sector. New right-wing media hubs have been popping up on the right over the last few years. Tucker Carlson uh, did one. I think that one still exists. Um, the people who did the fake pimp video about Acorn, those people, they tried to set up uh, a website that would become the new right-wing homepage for American conservatives. There's been lots of efforts to try to take over this territory, but nobody has been able to succeed in toppling the king of them all, which has been that way for a very long time now. The website that is more influential on the American right than any other by a factor of N uh, is, of course, the Drudge Report. As dominant as we think of the Fox News Channel in terms of defining the conservative mindset and Republican politics on television, in the online sphere, the Drudge Report is way more dominant than Fox is on TV. There's nothing like it on the right. It is absolutely the homepage for American conservatism, and it has been for more than a decade. And you can just watch American conservatism unfold there. The front page banner headlines at the Drudge Report over the last year and a half have been one way of sort of peeking in the window there to see how obsessed the right has been with the issue of Benghazi. Just looking at that one website, right? Drudge Report, Benghazi headline. Drudge Report, Benghazi headline. Drudge Report, Benghazi headline. Drudge Report, Benghazi headline. Drudge Report, this is a good one. He knew. They didn't even have to say. You just know that's a Benghazi headline. Drudge Report with a siren, Benghazi headline. This website, which is the hardwired brain of the conservative movement and conservative media and the Republican Party, this singular website, which is basically the wizard behind America's right wing Oz, the Drudge Report has been absolutely obsessed with the attacks on the American diplomatic facility in Benghazi almost two years ago. Well, today, the United States government announced that the mastermind of that Benghazi attack, the alleged mastermind, he was arrested in Libya, taken into custody by U.S. Special Forces and the FBI. Can you imagine how something like that is going to play on the Drudge Report, right? I mean, for more than a year and a half now, the Drudge Report has been burning out its sirens and having to get new ones, freaking out about everything Benghazi-related, hyping things that are not even about Benghazi in case they might have implications for Benghazi. Anytime anything else breaks in the news, it's a distraction from Benghazi. Well, today, they caught the guy who allegedly did Benghazi. Can you imagine how Drudge is going to deal with this news today? This was the headline for most of the day today on the Drudge Report. Price of meat, chicken, and fish soaring to an all-time high. After a year and a half of wall-to-wall three-inch headlines about Benghazi, today is the day that the Drudge Report chooses to lead with the fact that chicken prices are rising. As an aside, I should let you know that I don't actually know if chicken prices are rising. The other main source for this information seems to be WorldNet Daily, which, as you know, has also uh, been the source of the breaking news that President Obama is not only Muslim but gay and also secretly Muslim gay married, also blood moons. But today, what may or may not be high chicken prices, that was the Drudge Report lead story today. Later in the day, I should tell you, the Drudge Report did change up their main headline uh, to this one, uh, which concerns Mexican troops on the U.S. border. The dollar bill icon there on the right, though, that is uh, still about the high price of chicken. 
On TV, of course, the Fox News Channel um, has been Benghazi central to the point where it's sometimes even been weird and hard to follow. Uh, you may remember just a couple of weeks ago that a dayside Fox News Channel show, and dayside is apparently supposed to be their straight news, no opinion format, a dayside Fox News Channel show cut away from an official President Obama presidential press conference. And the host at the time uh, explained that Fox was only planning to go back to the president's live press conference if the president took a question about Benghazi. But if he wasn't talking about Benghazi, Fox had no plans to cover the press conference. See, because they had Benghazi stuff to talk about. Why would you cover a pres presidential press conference if it wasn't about Benghazi? Today, as the Washington Post first broke the news that the alleged leader of the Benghazi attack was in U.S. custody, that a successful special operations raid had gone off in Libya without a hitch, and the alleged perpetrator of the Benghazi attack was on his way back to the United States to face justice, I mean, one might reasonably expect that at the all-Benghazi, all-the-time Fox News channel, they would be excited about this big breakthrough news, right? Instead, though, at the Fox News channel, they seemed kind of just a little let down. And they quickly turned from the news of this guy being arrested to their own suspicions about the timing. Maybe this is all just a trick to help Hillary Clinton's book sales. Seriously. You have the former Secretary of State who's in the middle of a, a really highly high profile book tour. And I think this is uh, convenient for her to shift the talking points from some of the things that she's been discussing. I think this thing needs to be tied in a bow for certain individuals uh, to have a clean break from an incident that has become and will continue to be a scandal and an anchor around a certain individual's neck right. who may yeah. want to run for president. Well, and so there's having an interview today who might just News be having a, what, a, what a great right thing to announce on an interview tonight at Fox News that the perpetrators have been brought yeah. to justice. It's all too neat and it's too cute. And I, I want to give I, I want to be grateful. I always want to give the benefit of the doubt to our authorities. But in this case, it fears, feels too neat on the timeline. It's too neat on the timeline. It's too cute. After a year and a half of covering Benghazi wall to wall as if it were a year and a half long O.J. Simpson white bronco car chase, on the day that the alleged perpetrator of the Benghazi attack is arrested and brought into U.S. custody after a special forces raid, the take on Fox News is that that's not actually news. That is just designed to distract you from the Hillary Clinton book tour. It's all too convenient, people. Sheeple. It's been amazing, amazing, amazing on the right today. Conservative media is having a very, very hard time with this news today about the alleged leader of the Benghazi attack being arrested. They have, they have to make it into bad news. They have to make it into maybe even a scandal itself that the administration has captured the alleged perpetrator of the attack. And Republicans in Congress are doing the exact same thing. It's not just on the media. Senator Kelly Ayotte of New Hampshire put out a statement as soon as she heard the news today, which, again, you think would be, this would be greeted as good news. But Senator Ayotte instead said this, rather than rushing to read him his Miranda rights and telling him he has the right to remain silent, I hope the administration will focus on collecting the intelligence necessary to prevent future attacks and to find the other terrorists responsible for the Benghazi attacks. Oh, so you guys arrested the guy who did it? Well, I bet you arrested him wrong. <laughs> and I can't believe he's the only one you arrested. Wow. In February, Senator Ayotte joined with Senator Lindsey Graham and Senator John McCain to write uh, this letter to the White House expressing their outrage that no one had been arrested and brought to justice for the Benghazi attack. Now that someone has been arrested and is being brought to justice for that attack, Senator Ayotte has decided today that she's still outraged. Senators McCain and Graham today also stayed outraged, both of them insisting to the reporters today that the president was still doing it wrong, unless he brings this guy to Guantanamo. I bring him to Guantanamo. Where else can you take him to? Has the administration indicated where they're going to hold him? No. They're going to do no, with him? No. Not that I know of. Do what do you preference? think about what's that? Do you have a preference? Guantanamo. It's where we put terrorists when we apprehend them. Actually, no. Uh, in this case, and in every other case like this since President Obama has been the president, nobody new goes to Guantanamo. People come back to the United States and they go on trial in a regular court. But John McCain and, and Lindsey Graham and Marco Rubio and Kelly Ayotte and all the other Republicans in Congress who commented on this today say they have to come up with a way to turn this into bad news. 
They have to turn, figure out a way to turn it into bad news that the guy who allegedly led the Benghazi attack has been arrested. And so the way they've decided to make it into bad news is that that guy is not going straight to Guantanamo. So they're all lining up behind John McCain on this and saying, yeah, the guy's got to go to Guantanamo. Good thing we've still got a Guantanamo, right, Senator McCain? Good thing we in the Republican Party still have your leadership to follow on issues of foreign policy and terrorism and what ought to happen at a place called Guantanamo. I believe we should close Guantanamo. I'm for closing Guantanamo Bay. We need to close Guantanamo. I think Guantanamo should be closed. Uh, I think it's become a symbol and I would move those uh, detainees to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where we have a federal prison. John McCain ran for president of the United States uh, in 2008, saying he would close Guantanamo and prisoners who might otherwise have been handled at Guantanamo should be sent to federal prison. Now, President Obama is proposing to prosecute the alleged leader of the Benghazi attacks and send him to federal prison. So now John McCain is lighting his hair on fire and saying, no, the guy has to go to Guantanamo. Why do people keep asking John McCain what he thinks about these things? It's obviously not his strong suit. He doesn't even remember if he likes Guantanamo or not. Which is fine. I mean, we all have our weak spots. I can never remember if I like garbanzo beans or not. But I know that about myself. And so I would never try to, like, open up a Mediterranean restaurant. I don't know. It's not my strong suit. John McCain is like the king of foreign policy in the Republican Party, but he doesn't know what his own position is on Guantanamo or whether terrorists should be instead in federal prisons. His own position. I'd bring him to Guantanamo. Where else can you take him to? I would move those uh, detainees to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where we have a federal prison. Asked and answered. He can handle both sides of the debate. Today, after the Washington Post broke the story of this arrest and the White House confirmed it and the president made preliminary remarks about it at an event he was doing in Pennsylvania, the Attorney General Eric Holder and the FBI Director James Comey, uh, they both spoke about the federal criminal charges uh, that have been unsealed against the alleged leader of the Benghazi attack, who's just been picked up. These charges were first filed last July. They were unsealed today. The three charges that were unsealed today that he'll be facing, they could, if he's convicted, lead to life in prison or technically even the death penalty. But the Justice Department says they may add yet more charges. So it's going to be interesting to watch how Republicans handle this and whether they continue to try to turn it into a bad news story. I mean, this does come immediately on the heels of Republicans trying to return the American, the, to, um, Republicans trying to turn the return of an American prisoner of war into a bad news story. I mean, you'll remember all the Republican members of Congress putting out initially congratulatory, celebratory tweets and statements saying how excited and happy they were, like most Americans were, when we learned that Bo Bergdahl was being returned to the U.S. after five years in Taliban custody, right? All of those statements and tweets from Republican elected officials then had to be retracted because it became the Republican Party line that actually the return of this last American prisoner of war was supposed to be bad news, not good news like you might have first thought. So it's going to be very interesting right after the Bo Bergdahl political fiasco on the right to see if Republicans try to do that on this story, too, about the alleged ringleader of the Benghazi attacks. I mean, after screaming from the rooftops for a year and a half that the perpetrators in Benghazi had to be brought to justice, will Republicans in the conservative media be able to try to turn this into a scandal? Will they be able to make it part of their broader conspiracy theory that someone is actually being brought to justice for the attack? And this is all happening at the same time as Washington is trying to figure out how to process the legitimately bad news, the legitimately terrible news out of Iraq. I mean, as frustrating as it is to see somebody like John McCain cited as an authority on Guantanamo when John McCain isn't even an authority on John McCain's own position on Guantanamo. The reason that John McCain has been ubiquitous in the media for the past week is because he is also supposedly the Republican Party's greatest expert on Iraq and specifically on war in Iraq. And John McCain let the record show. John McCain was wrong about Iraq and the war in Iraq in almost every way that a person can be wrong about something like that. He was wrong about Saddam having weapons. He was wrong about how long the war would take. He was wrong about how big the war would be. He famously said that as far as he was concerned, he thought that maybe Saddam sent the anthrax attacks. John McCain was wrong about whether there might ever be any trouble between Sunnis and Shias in Iraq. 
Because John McCain was so wrong about Iraq, it is frustrating to see him everywhere, right? On the Sunday shows, on the cable news shows, in the paper, with reporters following him around the Capitol now, as if his previous abject and consequentially terrible failures on this exact subject somehow make him worthy of listening to about that exact same subject right now. And there is a lot of this going on right now. I mean, Iraq war architects like Kenneth Pollack and Robert Kagan are getting quoted in the New York Times again, advocating for another Iraq war, even though the last one they designed was such a disaster. Politico quoting Doug Fife, Bill Kristol on ABC, Paul Bremer in the Wall Street Journal and on CNN and here on MSNBC, Paul Wolfowitz on MSNBC and on Meet the Press, Judith Miller, the disgraced New York Times reporter that the newspaper had to apologize for after they ran her bogus pro-Iraq war incorrect stories over and over and over again on the front page, helping make a national case for that war. That was false. I mean, Judith Miller, literally her, not just somebody who looks like her. There she is back on Fox News in this case, making the case for Iraq war again. It, it is very frustrating to see that this is the way that we handle debates about foreign policy in this country. We take people who were so provably terribly wrong and bring them back and treat them like experts on the very subject they have been so wrong about. It is maddening. Their argument for taking them seriously is to ignore everything they've said up to this point. For neoconservative pundits, it's a sort of guaranteed job security. Push for armed conflict, and if it descends into chaos, then that's just another reason to push for more armed conflict. There are no consequences for being so wrong all the time. It is frustrating. If you have been feeling frustrated about seeing all these Iraq war architects and cheerleaders back out there doing it again with no accountability, you are not alone in your frustration. But you know what? We did learn something in the last 10 years. We did learn something from how we went to war the last time. That last quote that I just read that you saw on screen, that's from this article at Salon.com today. Look at the very satisfying headline. Stop treating war crazy buffoons as experts. They got it wrong, remember? And I think it matters for our national discourse that there are a lot of headlines out there like this right now, right? Oh, on Iran, let's ignore those who got it all wrong. Iraq war boosters get second chance in media spotlight. Media should stop boosting people who got Iraq wrong. How many times do the neocons get to be wrong before we stop asking them what to do in Iraq? Here's James Fallows uh, from The Atlantic tweeting a couple days ago, working hypothesis, nobody who's stumped for the original Iraq invasion gets to give advice about disaster now, nor should they be listened to. The liberal website Daily Kos even has this petition posted right now. Sign this. Tell Iraq war cheerleaders to shut up. As frustrating as it has been for you at home to see all of the Iraq war cheerleaders being quoted again, cheerleading for yet more war in Iraq, I have to say it is also satisfying. It also feels like we've gone through some measure of growth as a nation, that you are not alone in that frustration and that there are so many other even very outspoken people who are frustrated by that and the pushback is strong. The pushback is strong now. I mean, yeah, it's happening, but hey, Sunday shows, hey, op-ed pages, hey, cable news, hey, everybody. We know you are tempted to keep booking these yahoos on these subjects, but if you keep turning to the people who were famously wrong about Iraq to ask them what to do about Iraq, you at least will be laughed at, and you will be embarrassed that you did this, and you will eventually have to apologize or at least explain yourself for why you thought Bill Crystal should be explaining what to do now. We can see what you're doing, and it's funny and not in a good way. But for all of the calling the question that's sort of happening in Washington and in the media right now, for all of the truly red meat, right and left fighting and humiliation that is happening right now on our politics, on foreign policy issues, there is a real test for how we handle these questions in our nation that has nothing to do with short-term partisan gain and, and score settling and, and pointing, at la pointing and laughing at, at people who need to be pointed at and laughed at. There is something real that we can do here to sort of cut through both the funny stuff and also the bull. It is the genius of the founding fathers and the way they structured our constitution that when questions of war and peace arise, as they do right now with the terrible situation in Iraq two and a half years after American troops left there, when questions of war and peace arise for us as a nation, it really is very clearly supposed to be the Congress who explicitly makes the decision about what our country should do in terms of military intervention or not. It is not the Congress's place just to go in front of TV cameras and, and to tweet 
and to send grandstanding open letters. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gives Congress the job of making the actual decisions about real bombs instead of just throwing rhetorical bombs without consequence. And as much noise as we hear right now about the always wrong peanut gallery yelling that President Obama needs to reinvade Iraq, there was just as much of that noise yelling that President Obama needed to invade Syria last year, you may remember. And while it seemed for a moment like President Obama maybe was going to do that and he was threatening to use airstrikes in Syria, he threatened that all military force options were on the table in Syria. When it came time to maybe exercise those options last August, President Obama went to the Rose Garden and made a speech. He acknowledged the congressional clamor for U.S. military intervention in Syria, and then he called the question. He said, yes, he was open to the prospect of military intervention in Syria, and if our country wanted to do it, Congress should vote to do so. Congress should take a vote and say that's what we should do because that is Congress's congressional prerogative. And you know what? The United States did not start a war in Syria. Even after all those members of Congress were screaming that we ought to. We did not get involved militarily in Syria because Congress not only didn't vote to do it, they never took it up. They don't actually want to put their money where their mouths are. They just want to carp about it. When it came time in Syria, they did not want to take a binding vote on what to do. They preferred to just yell about it on TV. When President Obama called the question, it was over. Under the Constitution, Congress is actually required to get out of the armchair and make binding decisions on military matters. We are seeing the worst of the armchair quarterbacking right now on Bo Bergdahl and on the Benghazi arrest and on Iraq. But if you want to see this debate get much better really fast, if you want to see our foreign policy politics in Washington get much less petty, not TV talking points, not self-contradictory chicken price partisan diversions, right? If you want to see this become real, real decision-making with real accountability, then as was the case with Syria, and as is required by the United States Constitution, the Congress should be exercising its responsibility and its prerogative to make a binding decision on the use of American military force. Real decision-making. Scary, right?